Uh, wanted to introduce our next speaker for the afternoon. So Tekken is going to be talking to us about uh, revision histories, uh, a branch in time. Tekken is from Manchester and uh, he runs Northwest Ruby, which is for the Manchester and surrounding areas of the UK. He's been a freelancer and contractor for most of his career and he really likes working with teams to help build things that people really need. Uh, his talk is sort of more broadly about software maintainability from a Git perspective. Uh, and looking at the importance of revision history to actually get information across in teams. Uh, this is his third time giving this talk. He's also spoken at Brighton Ruby and RubyConf in LA. This is his third trip to Australia and his, one of his previous trips he actually managed to coincide with attending RubyConf in Australia. Uh, so he did, this is actually his second RubyConf AU. Uh, he did recently adopt a cat called Cooper. I insisted on the photos. You can find them on his Instagram and maybe his Twitter now. We'll, we'll get one on his Twitter. I saw a photo. Cooper has a really chubby little face and he's adorable and he's being missed dearly. So please welcome his dad, Tekken. <laughs> the lights don't really help with that. Meet Seema. Seema is an engineer at Docs R Us, a company that provides appointment booking software for medical professionals. Docs R Us was founded 10 years ago and has grown from a tiny startup to a successful company employing nearly 100 people. The app itself is a decade old majestic monolith. Code dating back to Rails 1 can still be found in its ancient hulk. The teams changed quite a bit over the years and only the CTO remains from those that wrote the early lines of code. Now, Seema has been at the job a few months now and feels like she's starting to get her head around the code base. Today, she's starting a new task. There's a page in the app where doctors can view the patients that they've had appointments with, and the patients are listed alphabetically. Seema's task is to update the page so doctors can also sort them by appointment date. That way they can see the patients they've recently had appointments with. Sounds straightforward enough, but whilst looking at the code, something catches Seema's eye. There's a method in the app that returns the patients sorted by their names. What she finds surprising is that rather than doing the sort as part of the database query, it's doing so using Ruby's sort method in memory. That doesn't seem very efficient, thinks Seema. She makes a quick change to perform the sort using the active record query instead and runs a test suite to see if anything breaks. But all the tests come back green, which suggests the in-memory sort is probably unnecessary, at least assuming the test coverage is good. Seema is eager to remove the in-memory sort as part of her work, but before she does so, she wants to understand why it was added in the first place, so she can be sure there won't be any unintended consequences. She starts by checking the models for clues. The patient's association is loaded through the appointment's association, and everything else looks as she'd expect. Satisfied she's explored the code enough, Seema knows what to do next. On her last job, she was fortunate enough to work with a couple of wizened old developers who taught her the ancient and mystic arts of Git Foo. She learned powerful techniques for searching through revision histories to uncover the truth behind how the, the code got to be the way it is. She starts off with a pretty basic git foo technique, git blame. Git blame will reveal the revisions and authors that last modified each line of code. She runs the command and picks out the line she's interested in. Git is telling her that the line was last edited by someone called Josie. I don't think she works here anymore, thinks Seema. If she did, Seema might have asked her directly why the in-memory sort was used, but given the change was made almost 10 years ago, she probably wouldn't remember. She takes the revision char for the line she's interested in and passes it to git show so she can see both the commit message and the full diff for the change. Looking forward to finding out why the in-memory sort was used, she runs the command and examines the output. <laughs> now, being the fastidious type, Seema is glad that Josie corrected this typo. As to the mystery of the in-memory sort, she's none the wiser. Unperturbed, Seema cracks her knuckles and prepares to try a more advanced git foo technique. Time to break out the pickaxe. Git log minus capital S, also known as the pickaxe, allows us to search through a revision history and find every commit containing a particular snippet of code. Now Seema's going to use the pickaxe to find the very first commit that introduced the sorted patient's method. She calls the method that she calls pickaxe with a method name as a search parameter and includes the patch option, so Git will show her the diff as well as the commit message. She also includes the reverse option, which instructs Git to return the commits in reverse chronological order. That way she'll see the first commit that introduced the method right at the top. Hopeful this will solve the mystery, 
She runs a command and inspects the output. Okay, so another dead end. Looks like Josie had a change of heart about the method name. I guess sorted patience is more intention revealing than load patience, thinks Seema, but she's no closer to solving the mystery. Not a problem, thinks Seema. She can just rerun the search, this time with the original method name. She calls the pickaxe again, this time searching for load patients. Perhaps this will finally solve the mystery. Okay. Feels like we're getting somewhere, thinks Seema. It looks like the sort was originally done in active record. And this is the very first commit that introduced the in-memory sort. And the commit message mentions something about an ordering bug, so it was almost certainly a deliberate choice. But there's still no clue as to what caused the bug or why this would have fixed it. Seema decides it's time to switch tact and goes looking for the original pull request for the change. She finds the commit on GitHub and clicks the magic and unassuming link that will take her to the pull request. She had hoped the pull request description might have given her a bit more context, but all she sees is a link to Pivotal Tracker. Unaware the company used Pivotal Tracker, she asked a coworker how she might access the project, but <laughs> turns out the Pivotal project was archived when the company moved to using Trello, and when the subscription lapsed, so did access to the project. Back on GitHub, she scrolls through the rest of the pull request. She finds a commit that adds some tests, and sure enough, it's verifying that the patients are being listed alphabetically. But there's nothing else in the pull request giving any indication why the in-memory sort was used. By this point, Seema's fresh out of ideas. Her search to discover the reason for the in-memory sort has come up fruitless. And whilst the test suite is giving her some confidence that removing it is probably fine, she's still a little uneasy. She decides to proceed with caution and keep an eye out for more clues while she continues her work. Okay, let's find out how we got here. Meet Josie. Josie is an engineer at Docs R Us, a startup building appointment booking software for medical professionals. Josie was one of the first engineers hired by the company when they secured funding and loves the fast pace of startup life. Today, however, she's having a bad day. She overslept and managed to spill her carefully crafted single origin pour over all over herself on her rush out the door. So not only is she running late and covered in coffee, she's severely undercaffeinated. Late the day before, Josie had been working on a, an urgent bug where patient records were being listed in the wrong order. They needed a fix pretty quick because they had a big presentation coming up with a potential new client. It was quite a puzzle, because when she checked the controller code, it looked like the patients should have been returned alphabetically. After a bit of digging, she figured out what the problem was. The patients association was being loaded through the appointments association, but the appointments association already had a default ordering on it, ordering the appointments by date. What this meant was that any time the patients association was called, the query would inherit the order clause from the appointments, and any additional order calls would be appended to the existing order. So instead of the patients being returned ordered by their names, they were in fact being returned ordered by the appointment date and then their names. Now the obvious fix would have been to remove the default ordering altogether, but when she tried that, there were a heap of test failures. Turns out there's quite a lot of code in the app that was relying on the uh, appointments being default ordered by their dates. Realizing it was going to take a while to unpick all the failures and needing to get a quick out fix, uh, a quick out fix in time for the demo, Josie made the decision to make a quick fix and uh, come back and remove the default ordering later. So she introduces a method to sort the patients once they've been loaded. Later, she changed her mind about the method name and also added a commit that added some tests. So here's how the commit history looks this morning. Her plan had been to tidy up the history before creating a pull request, but today she's feeling cranky and she just wants to see the back of this bug and move on to something more interesting. So she throws caution to the wind, pushes the code to GitHub, and creates the pull request. She uses the link to the Pivotal Tracker story for the bug as a PR description, because all the details are there. There doesn't seem like much point in repeating it. A short while later, she gets a notification telling her the build is broken on her branch. It looks like there was an integration test she forgot to update. So she adds another commit to fix the build, and then another one when a coworker points out the typo. Normally, her coworker would have pulled her up on such a messy history, but having seen the unhappy state they were in, she was in that morning, perhaps they thought it was kinder to let it slide this time. 
with the build green and the typo corrected, the PR is approved and the bug fix is shipped just in time for the big demo. Happy that she squashed another bug, Josie moves on to the next task, but not before adding something to the backlog to come back and remove the default ordering so it doesn't catch anybody else out in the future. Okay, so the eagle-eyed amongst you may be wondering at this point why Josie didn't simply use the reorder method, as that would have replaced the existing order clause defined on the relation. Well, that's because I've contrived Josie's timeline so her story happens in 2010, which conveniently for me <laughs> is before reorder was added to active record. All right, intermission over, back to the story. We'll try that one more time. Meet Josie. Josie is an engineer at Doxaras, a startup building appointment booking software for medical professionals. Josie was one of the first engineers hired by the company when they secured funding and loves the fast pace of startup life. Today's got off to a great start. She got up early to miss the rush hour traffic and enjoyed reading a really interesting blog post on revising revision histories while sipping her lovingly crafted single origin pour over. <laughs> The day before, she'd been working on a strange bug where patient records were appearing in the wrong order, and by the end of the day, she'd managed to put together a fix. The commit history was a bit of a mess, and her plan had been to tidy up before creating a pull request, hence her choice of morning reading. She decides that the commit where she renamed the method isn't gonna be much use to anybody in the long term, and at best would prove a distraction to a future developer trying to understand the change. She also decides that the history will be more focused if the change that fixed the bug and the test that covers it were part of the same commit. To rewrite the history, see, uh, Josie's going to use Git's interactive rebase tool. Interactive rebase makes it possible to revise a commit history by letting us edit, squash, reorder, and reword our commits. She tells Git she wants to interactively rebase the last three commits. And when Git presents her with those commits, she marks the rename commit and the test commit to be fixed up basically telling Git to squash them into the previous commit. And the main commit she marks as reword, so she can edit the commit message to better explain the change. For the commit message itself, she explains the nature of the bug and also why she chose to fix it this way. She also makes sure to mention the planned work to remove the default ordering. And this commit message serves as a perfect description for the pull request, saving her the trouble of having to write a new one. A short while later, she gets a notification telling her the build is broken on her branch. It looks like there was an integration test she forgot to update. So she updates the test and makes sure it passes before staging the change ready to be committed. But instead of creating a new commit, she uses the amend option, which instructs Git to add the changes to the existing commit, so the changes will be kept together in the same commit. And because she's happy with the commit message, she uses the no edit option. Uh, that way, Git won't prompt her to edit the commit message, and it will amend the commit in one command. And because, um, because she's amended a commit on her local branch that's already on GitHub, she's gonna have to force push the changes to overwrite what's already there. To be safe, she does so using force with lease. That way, Git will warn her in the unlikely event that somebody else has made a change to her branch in the meantime. When her coworker pots, uh, points out a typo during code review, she does the same thing amending the existing commit, so it's as if the typo never existed. With the build green and the PR approved, the bug fix is shipped just in time for the big demo. Happy that she squashed another bug, Josie moves on to the next task, but not before adding something to the backlog to come back and remove the default ordering altogether, so it doesn't catch anybody else out in the future. Meanwhile, back in the present day, Seema has just started a new task and is puzzling over why some code is sorting patients in memory rather than as part of the database query. She wants to know why and decides to use some git foo. She runs git blame to identify the revision she's interested in and passes it to git show along, uh, so she can see the commit message and the full diff. Ah, thinks Seema as she reads the commit message. So this was a workaround to get around a default ordering on the appointments association. The commit message also mentions some planned work to remove the default ordering altogether. And sure enough, when she checks the model, it's gone, now gone. I guess whoever removed it must have forgot about the in-memory sort. Oh, well, these things do happen. With the mystery solved, Seema feels confident she can remove the in-memory sort and continue with the task at hand. Now, as developers, we do many things to try and keep our code maintainable. We think hard about the names for our objects and methods. We write and maintain automated tests. We try and create good abstractions. We refactor. 
we make deliberate effort to keep our code easy to understand and easy to change. But here's the thing. Our software is so much more than just the code. At its best, code will clearly articulate what our software is doing. But if we want to understand the deeper why of our software and the code, it's key that we're able to understand how the code got to be the way it is. You see, we write modern software iteratively. Startups pivot, requirements change, bugs are found and hopefully fixed. We're constantly course correcting the code to keep up with our ever evolving understanding of what it is a software needs to do. And along the way, we make countless decisions and trade-offs, the consequences of which are felt long after we make them. And while we're doing this, we're building up a sort of institutional knowledge that defines our software in ways that the code will never really be able to express on itself. And it's our ability to grasp this ever-changing and growing knowledge that's as key to the maintainability of our software as it is to keep the code in good shape. Peter Nauer spoke to this in a paper he wrote in 1985. In the paper, he proposes that programming isn't actually about the production of executable code, but is actually the process by which programmers build up their theory, their mental model of how the software needs to work. In the paper, he states that the code is merely a secondary artifact. He goes a step further and states that for the software to remain maintainable and viable, the team that hold this theory need to, stay, need to be around. Um, the program effectively dies when this team is disbanded. Now, it's rare that an entire team is disbanded, but just like our software, our teams aren't static either. New team members join and quickly need to gain this knowledge and understanding to become effective, and long-standing members will leave, taking their hard-won knowledge with them. The power of the revision history is that it gives us a way to capture this knowledge and embed it right there alongside the code as it changes. And it does so in a way that's both searchable and in a way that won't go out of date. With a well-put-together revision history, every line of code is documented, every change is explained. And as the code base grows and ages, the value of this history grows with it. A bad history is debt that's virtually impossible to pay down, whilst a good one will repay a return on, its, on your investment long into the future. Now, for many of you in this audience, much of what I've said today will be self-evident. You're already quite confident revising and creating useful revision histories and regularly write novel-length commit messages. Equally, I imagine there are some of you for which, as great as this sounds in theory, doing this sort of stuff can be an intimidating prospect. Let's face it, it's called Git for a reason. Whilst Git is an incredibly powerful and versatile tool, its primary interface with its many commands and esoteric option flags can be a little confusing and aren't particularly user-friendly. Otherwise, we wouldn't need sites like Git WTF. <laughs> and unfortunately, there aren't really any silver bullets. Just like writing good automated tests, doing this stuff well takes patience and practice. My aim with this talk was to hopefully convince you that the effort is worth it. Uh, and I'd like to finish by sharing some simple tips, um, things that helped me on my journey to creating more useful revision histories. Now, there's only so much I can cover in the time I have available, but I've published a blog post with links to further resources on this subject. So do read that if you want to learn more on this. OK, on to the tips. First up, make sure you're set up for writing good commit messages. For me, this meant getting out of the habit of committing with dash M. Let's face it, the command line isn't an environment that encourages writing detailed commit messages. Instead, make sure your editor of choice is configured with Git so it knows uh, what you like to work in. That way, you'll always find yourself in a familiar environment, and you're much more likely to write a detailed message. I'd also recommend turning on Git's verbose mode. With verbose mode on, Git will include the full diff for the change right there in your editor as you write the message, which gives you an opportunity to review the changes while you formulate the words. This is also where I'll often spot something in the diff that I think perhaps belongs in a different commit, and it gives me an opportunity to back out the, the commit, restage the changes into a better shape. And when it comes to the commit messages themselves, focus on capturing the why as well as the what. The diff should hopefully already do a fairly good job of communicating the what, Instead, use the message to capture the context that might otherwise be lost once the changes have been made. Uh, one little mind hack I like to perform is to put myself into the shoes of a future developer that's trying to understand the change and think of the questions they might have 
and then answer those questions right there in the commit message. This future developer isn't even a hypothetical one. It's literally the person that's going to be reviewing your code if you do pull request reviews. I've got an example to illustrate the point. I was working on a project recently where I was refactoring some partials, and I came across one particular partial that didn't appear to be used anywhere in the app except for this one spec testing the PDF rendering code. Now, I wanted to remove this partial because it seemed unnecessary, but I didn't understand if there was any special significance for this spec. Luckily, the developer who wrote the spec was around, and I was able to ask them. And they confirmed to me that they'd chosen it because it didn't contain any locals or context, which made the spec easy to write. <laughs> now, capturing that information in the commit message would have meant that information would have been there for the lifetime of the project. Now, this is a useful example to illustrate the point, but it's not a great one. The information we're capturing here is fairly low value. It relates to the specific mechanics of this spec, and I could have reasonably figured out that it was safe to replace it with some static HTML. Far more interesting is capturing the sort of information that around the business logic and the decisions you make around the application, the kind of information that's almost impossible to figure out by looking at the code alone. Here's another little mind hack I like to use. If I find myself wanting to write a comment in the code, and there's no obvious way to refactor it to remove the need for the comment, then I'll ask myself the question, would it be better to put the comment into the commit message? That way, it's less likely to get lost or go out of date. OK, thirdly, think carefully about the shape of your commits. Now, in the story, Josie ended up collapsing all the code down into a single commit. Now, I hope the takeaway from that wasn't that you should just do everything as one big commit. That was mainly to keep the story simple and easy to follow. Instead, aim to create small atomic commits that focus on doing one thing. Think of your commits as almost like mini pull requests that gradually build up on the feature that you're trying to deliver. And thinking about the shape of your commits as you go is going to make your life much easier than trying to revise, and, uh, revise your history at the end. Your best friend here is the patch option, which lets you selectively choose the exact changes in a particular file that you'd like to stage. Think of it like a mini text adventure for staging your changes. Showing my age there. <laughs> Here's a, another little mind hack. Uh, that's that Kent Beck quote again that um, Kelly referenced in his great talk on monoliths. Um, I like to think about this quote often when I'm working on a new feature. If there's some code that looks like it could do with some refactoring to make adding the feature easier, then I'll try and break that down into two stages. My first commit will perform the refactoring without changing any behavior, and then the second commit would add the new behavior. That's going to make it much easier to both review the code and understand the new behavior without having to understand the refactorings mingled in between. Next up, get used to treating your local commits as mutable things that, up until the point they're merged into your main branch, you're free to chop and change and reshape as you see fit. There are some caveats here, of course. If you're collaborating with others on um, a branch, then you have to carefully coordinate any revising of the history as, so as not to cause any conflicts. A good place to start is using the amend option to modify the most recent commit. And if you want to take things a step further and start making changes to older commits in your local history, look up creating fix-up commits and then automatically squashing them down with an auto-squash during a rebase. And don't fear the rebase. It can be a bit scary and intimidating at first, but once you get used to it, it's an invaluable tool for revising your revision histories. And if you do find yourself in a pickle, you could always back out with git rebase abort. Finally, spending time searching through your histories is a really good way to build an instinct for the kinds of histories that will be useful to people in the future. Now, this might sound a bit controversial, but I'm going to suggest using Git blame a bit less. It's a pretty limited tool, as it can only ever show you the most recent revision on any given line. Instead, get used to using the pickaxe to search through your revision histories. It's way more powerful, as it can show you a, a full bespoke history for any snippet of code, both across multiple commits and across multiple files. And if you do find yourself really needing to identify the last revision on a particular line, use git annotate instead. It's basically the same thing, but slightly less accusatory language. <laughs> As I said before, unfortunately, there aren't really any silver bullets. This stuff takes practice, but hopefully those tips will help you on your way. Everyone in this room will exist somewhere on a spectrum of Git fluency, but we all start somewhere, uh, we all start at the same end. 
this history I created back in 2012 isn't going to be much use to anybody trying to understand the nature of the work I was doing at the time. Should we pause and admire these one-liners for a moment? <laughs> there's, there's actually more, but I won't talk to you further. Since then, I've been fortunate enough to work with some great developers who've helped teach me both some of the techniques that I'm describing today and also why creating a useful revision history is important. And it's with their help and patience that I've developed much of the skills that I'm sharing with you today. So my final tip is for those of you at the other end of the spectrum. So this stuff can be intimidating. If you work with someone whose commit suggests that perhaps they haven't fully mastered the art of putting together a useful history, or perhaps they don't fully appreciate the value in doing so, help them. And I don't mean leave snarky comments on their pull requests. Sit down with them, pair with them, show them how they can use Git to create more useful histories and help them appreciate why it matters. If everyone in this room that's mastered this stuff already helped two coworkers do the same, we'd all be better off. Thank you. <laughs>